By the end of this PowerPoint, you should be able to describe the main properties and structure of different monosaccharides with particular attention to the two different forms of glucose. You should also be able to explain how the alpha and beta glucose are different from each other and similar and you should know how the monosaccharides can be joined together by condensation reactions to form disaccharides. You should also know how to explain how the disaccharides can be broken down by hydrolysis reactions to form monosaccharides again. So carbohydrates are made from monosaccharides. Now this word monosaccharide just means it's a single sugar. The ones that we will come into contact with are glucose, fructose, ribose, deoxyribose and galactose. All monosaccharides are soluble, they're all crystalline and they're all sweet. I'll come back to those properties again when we look at disaccharides. Their general formula is CnH2O which means that actually sugars are really hydrated carbon. All monosaccharides can be classified according to the number of carbon atoms found in that molecule. We'll start off with the three carbon monosaccharides, which are called the triose sugars. The three letters at the end of this word, O's, indicates that this molecule is a sugar. Now triose sugars are usually found as part of other reactions, such as in the creation of more complicated sugars in photosynthesis or in the breakdown of those same sugars during respiration. They are very important. We tend not to deal very much with them in uh, the AS course, but we will come across them when we do the respiration and photosynthesis in the A2 course. The five carbon monosaccharides are known as pento sugars. These ones we will deal with because uh, ribose and deoxyribose play a very important part in the formation of DNA and um, other nucleic acids as part of protein synthesis. Six carbon monosaccharides are the hexo sugars and these are the ones that you'll be most familiar with because these are ones such as glucose and fructose and um, galactose. The hexo sugar that you will need to know the most about is glucose. And glucose exists in two main forms. Now these forms are known as stereoisomers. And what this word actually means is it tells us that when light is passed through these different types of glucose, it affects the way that that light is refracted. So the two main types of glucose that you need to know about are alpha glucose and beta glucose. Now stereoisomers may affect light differently, but their chemical properties are identical. So alpha glucose and beta glucose will carry out all the same chemical reactions as each other. However, they do look slightly different. And if you look at the uh, alpha glucose and beta glucose molecules we've got here, you'll see that they are very similar except for the um, area here that I've highlighted where the H and the OH groups have been uh, swapped over. Now on this these two diagrams, what you can't find are any carbon atoms and this is because the format for drawing these types of diagrams doesn't bother to include the carbons so they're found in each of the corners of, where of these hexagons apart from where the oxygen is. So if we have a look at this diagram and just make sure that we have a good understanding of how it all works. Here's an alpha glucose molecule. Now, as I mentioned to you before, the carbons are not shown on this diagram, but they are found in the corners. And so we would want to number each of these carbons so that we can identify the carbon that they're talking about during reactions. So we always refer to the number one or the number two or the number three carbon and so on. So the first thing to do is if you're asked to describe the differences between alpha and beta glucose, refer to the number one carbon, because if you just vaguely mention that there is a difference, you will not get that mark point. So it's worth mentioning that it is on the number one carbon, and describe how the hydrogens and the OH groups 
swap places in the beta glucose. So if you want to describe how one is above or one is below, that's perfectly okay, but you've got to really refer to the hydrogen and the OH group. Now while I've got this molecule here, it is worth pointing out that you can see that we've got a lot of H and OH groups on this molecule, and it's these which actually allow the molecule to form hydrogen bonds with water, which explains why glucose and disaccharides are soluble in water. Now lastly, we're just mentioning how the scientific explanation of how these slight differences in the number one carbons actually affects the way that the glucose works. Because chemically, being stereoisomers, they are exactly the same, so they're all their reactions um, to with other things will be identical, but their 3D shape is slightly different. And that means that the molecules will not necessarily fit into the active sites of, of any of the enzymes of each other. So if you, um, if you have an enzyme that's handling alpha glucose, it won't be able to fit beta glucose in it. And that explains why one of those molecules will be active and one of them won't be. Monosaccharides are important in playing a part in a number of different functions. The first one that most people think of when they think of uh, glucose is its importance in providing energy through the process of aerobic or anaerobic respiration. When glucose is broken down, quite often one of the byproducts of this is our trio sugars. So these are also intermediates in this process of respiration. So they are also important for break releasing energy. Just to remind you that the breakdown of glucose releases energy and this energy, which is stored in the bonds between the atoms, can then be uh, stored as a different molecule called ATP. Now, the thing to watch out for here is that you don't talk about glucose producing energy or respiration producing energy, which is the thing I see quite often written down as an answer and it is incorrect and you won't get the mark if you say that. So you've got to try and remember to use the word releasing instead of producing. Another function is as an energy store. So glucose and other monosaccharides, but mainly glucose, don't normally get stored um, as individual molecules, but they normally get built up into much larger storage molecules such as starch and glycogen. The next one is that glucose can be attached to other types of molecules and um, then these can be involved in a range of different activities. Uh, a, m a familiar one, and one that you will remember doing from the, the first course, is the glycoproteins. So attaching carbohydrate groups to protein molecules creates a molecule which is involved in cell signaling. And we could also join together a number of molecules to create a structural compound such as cellulose. So this has no metabolic activity in the cell, but is purely there to create strength for plant cells. So let's think about how we join monosaccharides together. Now this is a condensation reaction, and that will this condensation reaction results in the formation of a disaccharide. So here we've got a glucose molecule and another glucose molecule. And you can see highlighted on this diagram, we've got an OH group and an H group of the number one carbon in the first molecule reacting with the number four carbon of the second molecule. And they will react with each other to release a water molecule. And you can see on the second diagram here, we've got the formation of this glycosidic bond between these two adjacent molecules. And that's creating a one to four glycosidic link. Enzymes will be involved in this condensation reaction and their shape of the active uh, their active site will be complementary to the 3D shape of the alpha glucose molecules. I also have to point out as well that the release of water makes this a condensation reaction. That's what uh, this actually means. If we want to split our disaccharides, the hydrolysis reaction will break the sugars apart. So here we have a disaccharide here, and this disaccharide will be something like, m like maltose, and with the use of, a, of an enzyme again, then 
this bond that's formed between these two monosaccharides will be broken down and it will require water to be put in in order to make this reaction occur. So we call this a hydrolysis reaction because it, the word hydrolysis means water is splitting. So if we just compare these two reactions, monosaccharides are converted into disaccharides by condensation. Disaccharides are broken back down into monosaccharides by hydrolysis. The properties of disaccharides are very similar to the monosaccharides. So they're soluble, sweet and crystalline. So like the disaccharides, due to the large number of H and OH groups, this enables them to form hydrogen bonds with water which allows them to dissolve. It also means then that both monosaccharides and disaccharides are going to have an osmotic effect upon the cell. So high numbers of monosaccharides and disaccharides will lower the water potential of the cell. It's quite possible you could be asked to name the different sugars that make up a disaccharide. So if we start with our alpha glucose bonding with another alpha glucose, this will create a molecule of maltose and one of the byproducts of that reaction is water. So here we have a diagram that shows two glucose molecules bonding together and you can see here that we've got a 1 to 4 bond that's created between these two alpha glucose molecules. Maltose is often the product of the breakdown of starch or amylose or amyl amylopectin, so we quite often see it appear at that point. The next sugar disaccharide is where you have alpha glucose reacting with fructose. Now both of these sugars are made by plants during photosynthesis. So at the end of photosynthesis, glucose is the, one of the main sugars that's created, and so is fructose and those two sugars are then reacted with each other to form sucrose. And again, this is a condensation reaction where sucrose is formed and water is released. Now you might notice that fructose, although it's a hexo sugar, does look a bit different here because the um, carbons are arranged more as a pentagon than as a hexagon. And the last example we have of a disaccharide is lactose. And lactose is created when beta glucose reacts with galactose. Galactose is another hexo sugar, very similar in fact to um, glucose. And the molecule we get is lactose and water, so again this is a condensation reaction. Now this is the only example we have of beta glucose being used in a disaccharide. So at this point we'll just quickly run through some of the roles of the disaccharides. Starting with maltose, as I've mentioned previously, maltose is very often formed when starch is broken down and you find maltose um, stored in barley grains and that gives us this um, malty flavour. Sucrose is the transport sugars in the phloem and so as I mentioned in the previous slide we have uh, the um, glucose converted into fructose it's then reacted with some more glucose to create sucrose and this creates a very soluble sugar which can be transported around inside the phloem. Lactose is the sugar which is found in milk and it's the main energy source for babies and it's one of those sugars which um, a lot of people find that they are able to digest very well when they're a baby but become intolerant to lactose as they become an adult and in fact I would say that that is probably the most normal situation because it's um, most organisms lose their ability to digest lactose as they become an adult. You may remember during GCSE that one of the things you had to do was detect the presence of sugars in various different food materials. And the main method for doing this is using the Benedict's test. Now reducing sugars include glucose, fructose, maltose and lactose. And Benedict's test will change colour if it's boiled with some of this, um, one of these types of sugars. Now it's the copper ions in the Benedict's which are reduced by the sugars and that changes the colour. And at the same time you also get the formation of a precipitate and this precipitate creates a cloudiness in the colour. So 
this is often used as a qualitative test because what that means is that we're looking for the colour change to get some idea of um, how much sugar there is in there. If you look at the top right there you'll see the various different colours of the, the Benedict's goes. Blue is it's what it starts as and then it goes a greenish colour if it's got a little bit of glucose or um, reducing sugar and then the colour gets more intense until you get to this brick red colour which tells you there's lots of it there. But of course what it doesn't tell you is exactly how much of the um, sugar is in the solution. It just The, the colour gives you an indication but it doesn't give you an actual value. So you can turn this um, method into a quantitative method by using a colorimeter and this is something we will try to do in a, a practical or, or certainly something similar so what you do is you use your color stand your, your um, sugar standards and you carry out a Benedict's test on them and then from this you are able to produce a graph which is a calibration graph and we'll explain more about this later the other way of detecting sugar can be using things like glucose testing strips and these are semi-quantitative, they don't give you an actual number but um, the intensity of the colour is, an, is um, an indication of the quantity of the sugar in there and if you read on the side of the pot it kind of gives you an indication as to how much sugar you've got. Now of course not every sugar is a reducing sugar and sucrose will always give you a negative result with Benedict's. So you can still use this test to see if sucrose is present. So if you test a, um, a solution and it gives you a negative result, then the first thing you can do then, it will, obviously you have to do the Benedict's test first, but after that what you would do is you would then do the non-reducing sugar test. So in order to do this what you do is you take your sample and you boil it with some acid so just some hydrochloric acid is usually what's used and this will break any disaccharides down so if there's sucrose in there it will split the sucrose down into glucose and fructose. You then neutralise the acid with some sodium bicarbonate and then you do the Benedict's test again and then if you get a positive result the second time you know that there is a non-reducing sugar in there. Finally you should be able to answer questions on this topic and the sorts of things that you could be asked to do might be to draw a simple glucose molecule. You should be able to draw or explain how a glycosidic bond forms. You could be asked a range of different experimental questions on the Benedict's test and these often appear and um, they expect you to be able to use a colorimeter in a quantitative fashion. So we will be practicing those questions. And this topic is very often linked with many other topics which um, require an understanding of biological molecules such as enzymes or the movement of molecules across membranes or even something like photosynthesis and respiration which you'll do in year 13.